Contest Caprice was written by Leroy Ostronsky and is copyrighted in 1958. I really like this piece for tenor saxophone. One of the things I like about it really is that it's an original piece for tenor saxophone. So many of the things that we have for tenor uh, that we do for contest are all transcriptions. The box, the Vivaldi's, the Telemans. And so it's really nice to play something that was written specifically for the instrument. Now, what is contest caprice? Well, contest I think is pretty straightforward. A caprice is something that's very humorous or fanciful. And it gives us a lot of an idea of what the character of this piece needs to be and what we need to instill in it. Well, where does that occur? Well, there's lots of unexpected kind of changes that happen throughout this piece. And that's, I think, the thing that makes it kind of fanciful or you're not sure of what it's going to do. And one of those things is dynamics. We get extreme dynamic contrasts where we're forte and we go all the way down immediately to piano. And also with the range, where it's up in the higher palm key range and comes all the way down into our lower range. The next thing that makes it more humorous or fanciful is the rhythmic element that he instills in here. The first thing is he, he doesn't always keep things right on a nice metrical downbeat. There's a lot of tied notes. And so the movement happens after the downbeat. Another thing that he does rhythmically is he's putting accents with sforzandos on the upbeat, putting the beat and the metric pulse where you don't expect it to be. Now overall, the piece is very, very lively. It's a lot of fun to play. It's got a lot of staccato, a lot of accents, and it just really, it's a piece where you can have a lot of fun with it and really, really let your technique shine as you go through the whole thing. The form of this piece is essentially in three sections. You get an A section at the beginning, which is divided into two different melodies. Uh, measures 1 through 26, and then at measure 27, you get a similar character melody, but a definitely different melody. The B section occurs over on the second page, and we get a cantabile, or a very singable-like melody, and then at the very end, we get just a restatement of our opening melody, uh, just to close out the piece. It's very, very short, but essentially we have a three-part form. It's very nice because the, the fast A sections allow you to really let your technique shine along with your, your articulations and your tonguing and style. And then you get that nice cantabile section which allows you to show a very emotive side. And the nice thing about that too is it's all above the staff. It's very, very singable, longing kind of quality. We'll talk about that more later. The opening tempo for this is marked Allegro Vivace without any indication for exactly how fast we're supposed to go. Which I, I kind of like because a lot of things that we're doing as performers is we're really instilling our own stamp on a piece of music. And you should be able to have some leeway. And when, sometimes when a tempo marking is there, you feel like you're really forced into that. And not all music should be that way. Sometimes it needs to be, but not always. So here, what I've done is I'm going to do most of the examples that today for you at a quarter note equals 116. You certainly want it to be fast. Vivace is faster than Allegro, obviously. He didn't want it quite as fast as Vivace because he put Allegro Vivace. The thing about this piece is that it really does sound technically very challenging at even the 116. You don't need to push this up into 130s or 140s to make it work. The other reason that I'm starting more at a 116, you can go 120, you can go faster than that, whatever you want, is that when we get to our last A section, in order to build up contrast and energy, I kind of like to take those, those repeats, especially when they're so short like that, even though it's marked odd tempo, I like to push the tempo just a little bit gives it an exciting ending, more of a flourish towards the end. So if I had to start really, really fast at the beginning, I can't do that at the end, or it goes so fast that it really doesn't sound that good. So I take it at a good fast, but moderate fast tempo at this beginning part, and then when we get to the last A section, bump up the tempo so you can end with a flourish. Here are the opening measures of the Contest Caprice. <laughs> This whole opening section, the measures one through twenty six really shows us a lot of what's going on here with this caprice. You notice that it's got a lot of forward motion. It's always feels like it wants to go ahead. Wants it never resolves. It never wants to sit. It pushes all the way through. And then when you think it's going to, all of a sudden it goes a different direction. 
we see these dramatic dynamic changes go over here about measure uh, 12, 10 and 11 and 12, where 14 helps somebody come all the way down. But then immediately after that at 13, we're starting to crescendo up again. And then when we get to 14 and 15, this is a very neat little effect that he's done here. He gives us a G and a G sharp, which really is resolving to the A, which is our central pitch through this opening section. So he's got a, a forte marking here. And I've changed that a little bit in order to get some more forward motion going. Because at major 13, we're going up this scale, actually major 12. <laughs> take this forte, I go mezzo forte, or but at least what I try to do is give it forward motion here because we want to keep pushing to that A. And then notice, look at the dramatic thing. He's going all the way down from our low E, and then by major 15, he's all the way back up to the E, and, and at major 14, he comes all the way back down into this very, very soft little lick. And you can hear he's starting to move it up again. And it just goes up and down, but it never really feels like it settles. It's always pushing forward. And this is the cool thing about this piece, which makes it a lot of fun to play. Technically, one of the things you're going to be challenged with are these tied notes. If you look over in the very first line of this piece, about measure four, five, and six, you notice that these little motives, da-da-da, gets tied over into the second beat. Set your metronome right from the beginning when you start playing this piece and make sure that you're very conscious of your subdividing and counting so that you're always hearing and, and thinking those downbeats. And these occur all over. You see them over here again in measure 9 and measure 10. It's the same little motive. And you want to make sure that you're waiting until after that downbeat. Otherwise, you're going to be taking just a small liberty, but you can see musical line. We always got to be thinking about it because we want to always remember where is the phrase going. And in here, I want to talk about one really, really neat musical line because I do make one more dynamic change here, and I want to talk about it. And this occurs over at measure 45. Well, notice that we go down to a piano here, and then we go up on this little arpeggiated pattern that starts on an A. Two measures later, it goes up to a B. Two measures after that, it goes to a C. And then in measures 49 and 50, it stays on that C. And 51, it stays on the C. But then it goes to the C sharp, in major 52, and in major 53, he takes you up to the D, and then over at major 58, it goes back up to the D, and it just really reiterates it through that point. But now we want to create forward motion all the way through here, and the dynamic marking over at major 49 is forte. Now I've changed this, and I've changed it down to a mezzo piano because major 49 and 50 repeat. You've got the exact same rhythm, the exact same notes. You can see he's giving you lots of dynamic things here to look at. But essentially what's happening is you're following the line up and you're following it down. So as the arpeggio goes up, you bring up the volume. As it goes down, you bring it down. But the, the foundational line, note in this line is that C. But what I've done here in major 49 is made it mezzo piano. Major 50, I think mezzo forte. Major 51, also think mezzo forte a little bit louder. But here you get the arpeggio changes. So you get a little bit of a difference at this spot. So your ear hears it leading somewhere. Then 52 C sharp, of course, a little bit louder. And then finally, when you get up to that D. So really, we want to hear the musical line. to really give it a solid, firm ending so that we can, and that we know through that whole line that that's our goal, that's where we want to go. Mm -hmm. 